Our next speaker is Catherine Karunas. So I'm going to talk about how chromosomal inversions affect recombination and thus interspecies gene flow. So as you know, many related species continue to hybridize with closely related taxa following speciation. And this hybridization provides opportunities for gene flow. So let's think of a species just as a cluster of alleles and linkage disequilibrium. So let's consider this first distinct cluster to be species one here and species two represented by this distinct cluster here. And when hybridization is occurring, there's the opportunity for recombination to shuffle these clusters and degrade the distinction between the distinct groups. So a big question in studying speciation is why do hybridizing species often persist as distinct species despite these opportunities for gene flow? And what we're really asking is what's preventing gene flow in the face of hybridization? And one well-known factor is chromosomal arrangement. So chromosomal inversions inhibit gene flow by interfering with meiotic recombination. When you have a double-strand break in DNA and it's repaired during meiosis, you can get crossing over or you can get non-crossover gene conversion, which you might be a little bit less familiar with. Now, non-crossover gene conversion differs from crossing over in that it's not this big reciprocal exchange of DNA. Instead, it's this very small, on the order of hundreds of base pairs, non-reciprocal recombination event. So what happens is one allele is used as a template for repair of a homologous allele, such as this red allele being used as the template for repair and converting this blue allele. Now when you have an inversion heterozygote, pairing happens a little bit differently during meiosis. So let's consider a wild type chromosome with gene order A, B, C, D, E, F, and an inverted chromosome with this inversion E, D, C, B. So in order for pairing to occur, one of these arrangements is going to form this loop which the other arrangement will conform to. And if you have a single crossover within this inverted region here, you're going to get dicentric and acentric products. So you will not recover single crossover products. Now you can get double crossover products, though this happens at a diminished rate compared to what we would predict. We understand this fairly well. What we don't understand is to what extent gene conversion can occur within these inverted regions. And that's exactly what I'm trying to address. So we have population genetic data and LD-based estimates telling us that gene conversion occurs within inverted regions. And we have theory telling us that this is evolutionarily important and that even low levels of gene flow can erode genetic differentiation over generations. We have limited empirical evidence telling us that gene conversion occurs within inversions. And by limited, I mean that in terms of observing gene conversion within a single generation, so not inferring from population genetic data, this is limited to one, one study by Chovnik in 73, looking at the inverted regions and um, using the rosy locus in Drosophila. So I want to know if gene conversion frequencies vary independently of inversions, because if this is true, then inversions may be weaker barriers to gene flow than we often assume. We tend to think of inversions as these impermeable barriers to gene flow because uh, crossing over is suppressed, but I think it's a lot more complicated than that. And I'm tackling this using the sister species pair, Drosophila pseudobscura and Persimilis. These diverged about half to one million years ago, and the inversions that differ between these species contribute to their maintenance as distinct species. They exhibit greater nucleotide divergence in and around the inversions, and reproductive isolation genes map almost entirely to inversions. And they do hybridize in nature at a low rate. They're parapatric with both species occurring over here in Western North America. And we're utilizing both interspecies and within species crosses. So I have an interspecies cross where Pseudobscura and Persimilis differ at inversions on the second and third chromosome, as well as two inversions, one on each arm of the X. And then we have within species crosses where we're taking advantage of the additional inversion polymorphisms on the third chromosome of Pseudobscura. So this is what one of our crosses looks like. This is the interspecies cross where we're starting with two 
highly inbred homozygous lines, cross to yield a heterozygous F1, crossed again to the same line of pseudo-obscura used in this first cross, and whole genome sequencing of the offspring reveals where recombination has occurred. Very large reciprocal transfers indicate crossing over has happened, and these small non-reciprocal transfers indicate gene conversion. So after SNP calling, I have a pipeline of Perl scripts that looks at every SNP in each individual and identifies whether that individual is heterozygous or homozygous at that SNP. And then I just scan along the chromosome for changes in heterozygosity and homozygosity. So gene conversion looks something like this, for example, where we see a shift from homozygosity to a small region of heterozygosity and back. And this is what this looks like in actual read data. So I'm just showing you a view in IGV, a genomics viewing tool, where each colored line is just a very thin line representing a read aligned to the reference. And we're looking at a roughly 250 base pair stretch within one of the inversions on the X chromosome. Now, the first two individuals here at the top are the parents of this F2 offspring. So this is that heterozygous F1 that I described when describing the cross, and this is the homozygous pseudo-obscura that it was crossed to. And here we have one of the F2 offspring. And if we zoom in on these two adjacent SNPs right here, we see that the F1 female is heterozygous, as expected. The pseudo-obscura male that it was crossed to is homozygous. No surprises there. And this F2 female happens to be heterozygous. And this becomes interesting when we look at the surrounding regions and see that at these flanking SNPs, so here's a SNP here, and here are two SNPs over in this region. The F2 female is homozygous. So this individual has inherited both possible alleles here, but only one at the surrounding loci. And this is that signature of gene conversion that I was describing, where we see a shift from homozygosity to heterozygosity and back to homozygosity over here. And these flanking SNPs can also be used to tell us about the maximum possible track length of this gene conversion event, which is important for extrapolating gene conversion rates from this data. So I've identified gene conversion throughout both inverted regions of the X chromosome in the interspecies cross. And this is the inversion on XR shown from breakpoint to breakpoint over here. It's roughly 12 megabases. And here is XL. And you'll notice that gene conversion occurs along these inverted regions. You might expect that gene conversion would be suppressed near inversion breakpoints where pairing might be a little more strained and where crossing over is suppressed. But just qualitatively, we're not seeing any striking clustering of gene conversion towards the central regions of the inversion or away from the breakpoints. And I also mentioned that we have within species crosses. So, Recently, I've been analyzing the third chromosome data where we have either Pike's Peak or standard arrangement, just names of the inversion difference. And the interspecies cross is heterozygous for this inversion. And then within species, we have pseudo-obscura standard cross to pseudo-obscura Pike's Peak, so an inversion heterozygo, and Pike's Peak cross to Pike's Peak. So that one is completely collinear. There's no inversion differing on this chromosome. And to give you an idea, of the gene conversion rates per nucleotide that I'm observing along this chromosome. Here are some numbers. In both the inversion heterozygote shown here, the inner species and the within species inversion heterozygote, I'm seeing a gene conversion rate of about 3 times 10 to the negative 5 using those maximum track lengths that I mentioned. And this number is really similar between inverted and collinear regions, which is, which is really cool. And it's also about 10 times higher than a previous LD-based estimate from just pseudo-obscura. And to again illustrate that we're really seeing gene conversions throughout these inverted regions, here's the interspecies cross, so this, this first set of data points, the inverted region from breakpoint to breakpoint, and this one is also about 12 megabases. Now I'm also trying to see what else I can learn about the characteristics of the gene conversions that I've identified. And you might know of a phenomenon called bias gene conversion, which is well documented at least in yeast and mammals, where one allele has a higher chance of being the donor allele used as the template for repair 
such as an AG mismatch being more likely to be repaired as CG than AT. But consistent with other evidence also in Drosophila, I'm not seeing anything to suggest that GC bias gene conversion occurs here. In fact, the numbers are split pretty much 50-50, maybe slightly biased towards being repaired as AT, but very, very close. So to summarize what I'm seeing, gene conversions occur throughout these inverted regions. And my preliminary estimates of gene conversion rates suggest a much higher rate of gene conversion than expected based on LD-based estimates. My average maximum track length is about 300 base pairs and no evidence for GC bias gene conversion so far. So I think that the really cool thing about this is that we've now directly observed gene conversion within the inversion of a species hybrid in a single generation. And now we can start to gather more informed estimates of how much gene conversion can occur and how much gene flow can occur because of that gene conversion. So this brings me back to my original point that inversions may be a bit more complex as barriers to gene flow than we often assume. Certainly, gene conversion is occurring throughout these inverted regions. This is very in progress. I'm continuing to expand across the whole genome. I've just presented data from the X and from the third chromosome here. Soon I'll be doing some statistical analyses to get maximum likelihood estimates of gene conversion rates and track lengths, and empirically confirming a subset of the observed gene conversions I have, as well as doing some additional analyses, including looking for any motifs that are enriched in and around recombination events. So I want to thank the Noor Lab, particularly my advisor, Mohammed Noor, and thank you to all of you for listening. So in the lab, you can generate these gene conversions, but how much do you think that that makes an impact when you go into nature? Right. That's a really interesting question. And I think that that's one of the things to consider when we think about how the impacts of like double crossovers bringing alleles in through gene conversion and gene conversion bringing in, anyway, double crossovers bringing in alleles and gene conversion bringing in alleles is that I think gene conversion might be less likely to be sort of noticed by selection if it brings an allele into an inversion that's acting as sort of a locally adapted cassette because it's only going to be, you know, a small number of base pairs. But, but I, don't, I don't know how it would be affected by selection. But. More questions? Do you know why or how to explain the difference between the LD-based estimates and your direct estimate? So I think that ties back to a similar thing where if an inversion is acting as a locally adapted set of alleles and recombination is bringing in other alleles into this locally adapted set, they might be maladaptive and thus eliminated by selection over generations. So you wouldn't see them in population data as much as you see it in a single generation. Yes? So this is also sort of the Drosophila meeting, so I want to ask, do you think this might also be happening on our Ballinger chromosomes? That's a really interesting point, too. And there is evidence, published evidence, which I can give you citations for, that, that gene conversion occurs within Ballinger stocks. And double crossovers as well. All right, well, ask me later if you think of something. <laughs>